Hello and welcome to episode 18 of Taste My Game Face. I'm Zizi Adiemo and I am joined today by Alan Heath. Hello. And Daniel Slauson. Hello. Cool. So, I I mean, I, was it yesterday or the day before? Um, we've had the glorious announcement of, well, is it the announcement? Anyway, the, yeah, yeah. the introduction in some form of the new Deus Ex game, the sequel to, um, was it... 2012's Human Revolution, which is being called Deus Ex uh, Mankind Divided. Mm. Um, and it looks sheer hot. Yeah. Got a good trailer. Have, have <laughs> both of you seen the trailer? Yes. Cool. But you haven't played the, any of the previous games, right, Alan? No. I have. I do technically own the last one, the, the director's cut of Human Revolution on Steam, but it it was one of those very generic, get it in a Steam sale, never get around <laughs> to playing it. So uh, one, one of those day, Maybe now I'll actually, you know, this situation, now that they've announced the next one, maybe I'll actually get around to playing this finally. Oh man, mm. you really, really should. It's, it's something really special. I mean, I, we've, we've talked about it every now and then on the podcast, but their ability to imagine a world and to kind of, bring out all of the all of the different pieces of what's required to make a cyberpunk world and make them all believable enough like just the the kind of bits of literature in it start off with experiments that have actually happened about um enhancing people with cybernetics and then as they get further forward in time they then start kind of making up their own ones in a way that that seems to sensibly extrapolate from it and the 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 attention to detail and designing the environments like i remember reading an interview uh, where one of their lead designers was talking about how he'd spent ages making different furniture for offices just to add that that extra feeling of believability so i it's <laughs> it's something that i don't think triple a games tend to aim at usually it's more about getting that that gameplay feeling down getting that that sense of spectacle like ratcheted right up to 11 but with Deus Ex they were more focused on creating a yeah a feeling of a whole cohesive world and that I think did a lot for almost everybody that played the game I think it's it it wasn't perfect I think it did some really good things to build on what Deus Ex started off as Mm -hmm. because like the original Deus Ex I I went back to try and play the other year and as as groundbreaking as it must have been, is it's not that easy to go back to. Like I put in hours and hours and hours, but it was just it was a bit too obtuse mm-hmm. about about because I I had the obsession of like going because the beauty of Deus Ex is you can go down any sort of path you want to complete an objective. But then I had the obsessive side of me wanted to just make sure I covered every path, so I'd sneak in one way, then knock everyone out, and then walk back through every other route, which kind of <laughs> which kind of broke the feel of it um i think the new one did a lot a lot good i think it can definitely improve in a lot of ways though yeah like, i mean they definitely felt like there were a few corners that were cut in it but it seemed like they'd, I, they'd really pick their battles to mm, make sure they yeah, yeah had that right sense of atmosphere and i think i think the the main problems were probably like presentational things mm-hmm. like i thought it was weird when you did sort of action like actions in the environment such as uh melee killed someone or jumped down a, a lift shaft and used one of your powers it it the screen went black and then it cut to like a separate animation oh and yeah then it kind of cut back yeah i've forgotten the screen black part yeah there was definitely a little bit of <laughs> odd it felt yeah. it felt kind of out of sync with itself yeah. but and that was weird. And then also, like the all the character models in it had slightly too big shoulders and slightly too small heads. 
Although, weren't they, weren't they kind of trying to create a, a kind of sense of renaissance artwork thing? So they were trying to give people like mm. roughs and, and stuff like that all the time. So having things but be a little bit disproportional in the right way I, was. I think, I think that's giving too much credit on that one. I, I think they, I think they just didn't quite get it right. I, uh, I, no, I, I think that, I think that the way that the characters looked was probably intentional, but I think the mm. way that they moved was the problem. Yeah. Because okay, they yeah. definitely hadn't sorted out the facial animation stuff. Like, p- people moved a bit stiffly. Um, mm. and yeah, it's probably for the sake of making sure that everything ran smoothly, but mm. it meant that people didn't move smoothly. You got a solid frame rate, but <laughs> it still what? looked like people were, I don't know, um, Strange wooden skeletons. <laughs> mm. I think one of the other problems of the first game, which I think if you look, watch the trailer, they sort of address ever so slightly, is in the first game, like most people, I think, try to play it stealthy. They don't often just go hit guns blazing. And also, it's not that viable in Deus Ex because if you get shot, you take loads of damage. Mm-hmm. But in the first game, they did the whole thing, which obviously they tried to repair in the director's cut, and I haven't played the director's cut, so I don't know how successful this was, but is the boss fights where you essentially were were quite screwed if you'd gone down the stealth yeah. path of like development, and then you had to fight these massive bosses with like gatling guns on their arms or yeah i mean or whatever it was it wasn't it was out of sync in terms of like however you've been playing the game might not be how mm. you face the boss fights and there's uh, and the reason for that was because they they actually outsourced the boss fights but yeah, i think yeah. i think worse than that the the bosses although they had interesting design and seen and like from the trailers and stuff they looked like they were going to be an interesting and pivotal parts of the plot they they were barely involved in the rest of the game. Mm, and yeah. although, although like the game was very, very well written and the story kind of winded between all of, all of these different kind of competing companies that would try and do each other in and take, mm. take hold of the world share of the market and all sorts of other strange conspiracy theories that were underlying that the, mm. the guys that they were employing to, to do the wet work. Like you <laughs> only knew them from a cutscene right at the start, and then every yeah. now and then you bumped into one of them and had to kill them. Mm. Um, it's um, mm-hmm. it's interesting that one because in the original Deus Ex, quite a few sort of the major bosses start off the at the beginning as your colleagues, essentially. Well, you end up you end up picking picking sides between companies in the first one. If I if I've got this right, I haven't played it. Oh, you, I may is, not. I may not have even got that far. This, this is this is just what I've heard. But um, I think I think that might be quite a thing towards the end. Mm-hmm. But um, because I did get far in it, but I didn't get like right to the end. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but there is you know definite things at the beginning. You start off as part of this company, but then obviously there's conspiracies and stuff. So then the people who you're working with eventually become your enemies. Um, and so and so you definitely get to know those characters. So it was an interesting sort of dropping of the ball i suppose with the the more recent one yeah so i mean i guess the reason that we're talking about all of the problems with the game that we really liked which was yeah, the more recent we... deus ex is this is what we hope they'll be improving yeah yeah definitely and and in the trailer they uh where i was going with like talking about the stealth stuff is you see him use some some stealth augmentations like in this first trailer which i think is quite sort of you know, good to see, like, he goes invisible and then he, he has, like, a taser as part of his, like, robot arms. Oh, but it's, like, what are you call them just a taser? It's, it's yeah, like it's, a, it's weird... like a three-pronged <laughs> taser thing. Yeah, but... it kind of pops up these kind of little electric darts behind each knuckle that <laughs> then individually get fired at the same guy yeah. afterwards, it, which it's is pretty like funky. Batman. It's mm-hmm. really weird that they would have outsourced the boss fights for the first one, or yeah, the, the third, a... for the last one, sorry. It's mm-hmm. just... Yeah, it's just weird how, like, boss fights either become something that people don't think are very important, so they leave it to the last minute, or just can't get right. Wasn't it something like yeah. with um, Gears of War 2 ended up just borrowing code for a boss fight from Resident Evil 5 <laughs> <laughs> for one of its boss fights, because they, they just couldn't get it right, so they asked for help or something. Oh, me. That's so weird. Yeah, I I suppose <laughs> they're they're an incredibly difficult thing to get right though because you're presented with you've you've created your whole 
kind of uh interlinking different systems for your game right and you've and you've tuned them to make them enjoyable and then you end up with this one specific set piece where where the the ante has to be raised and like whatever kind of character that you've been building up for them to fight has to be like trickier um in in whatever way you can but you've but you've already taught somebody the like how to play a game that is probably not what's going to be going on in the boss fight. So how do you make mm. that both challenging and enjoyable and different all at the same mm. time? Yeah. I, I, I think, I think, I think boss fights are like either, I think they're so easy to become either the best part of a game or the worst part. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you think about something like Metal Gear or Bloodborne, like we were talking about last week, it, these boss fights like make these games. Mm-hmm. And then you get games like Shadow of the Colossus, which are essentially only boss fights and it's just complete, like almost perfection. But you like, see, but then, they were really but, clever there because they, because all of the rules of their, of their game, of, yeah, well, of, yeah. of the adversarial game mechanics are what the boss fights are. They don't have to worry about having a, like two games in one and mm. having people learning each of them to different degrees. So mm. yeah, I mean, it's it, bloody excellent. So it panned out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully, I mean, well, from, from the trailer that we've seen for the new Deus Ex, for their uh, introduction of the, of the, well, the th- the themes of the game and the, and one mm. of the main characters that's carrying them that appears to be a boss. I, yeah, I guess actually the really good side there is that they're definitely bothered about making sure that the he's a character. Yes, precisely yeah. that yeah. that he has a message and and it, what it appears to be for anybody that's listening to this and hasn't seen the trailer is that after kind of the events of the previous Deus Ex, which were kind of the um. D- d- fractious divides being developed between people that could afford uh, bionic and cybernetic enhancements um, compared to those that couldn't, and the yeah, this kind of that the haves and the have-nots that that was creating that the possibly the events of of that game have have turned around on themselves, and people with enhancements are now being shunned and <laughs> and looked down upon and put in prison for being better i don't know i guess we'll find out when we play the game Mm. but um i think that's the really interesting thing about deus ex because it deals with it deals with the morality of enhancing humans with robotics but Mm. then it also deals with the social aspect of people being able to afford robotics or being able to afford the drugs that you need to take in order to have these robotics it's and stuff. proper so sci-fi it's it like pro- it, it's it taking like these two things it's that taking go up against each other but bits of human conflict that kind of exist in some form now and and seeing how they translate into into a, a different into a different context one provided by technology so mm. yeah and it it just it looks like they're going to get that right again I mean, mm. if that, if that trailer says anything, it, it says that they are still very invested in making sure that they're delivering proper sci-fi. Mm. But also that the fights are going to be bloody awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Never trust so. a CG trailer to yeah, true. tell you that's how what our I was game's going to play. Is, is there, has there been any word if that's in engine? I don't think there has been. I think it's probably CG. I think it's CG. There were like, mm. there were definitely elements of it that looked like game engine. Mm. almost flaws that you would get in a game engine but at the same time mm. there are a lot of parts that just look too good it's at mm. least like by being pre-rendered there's a pre-rendered, lot of ex- yeah, yeah. extra rendering effects on top even if yeah, it is well, I mean, within his, his, game assets his, his animations definitely are not in-game yeah. animations because it, it being a first person game they aren't going to do that <laughs> if only they did although they yeah. did although as you were saying before like a lot of the animations they did previously were in third person so yeah, true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously CG trailer, so you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Um, but I used to see CG trailers and assume that the game was going to be nothing like that at all. And mm. at least with the, with the last, uh, with the last ASX, with the, some of the trailers they had for it, they showed off a lot of the moves that, uh, mm. Adam Jensen was able to do in the game. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I expect to see most of that stuff in some form, if not quite so uh, smooth, smoothly uh, played out, mm. like being able to fire bits of my body off of people to kill people. <laughs> Just look really cool. <laughs> That's a special kind of uh, augmentation. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, but the the whole design of it, like the the set dressing, all of the kind of hexagonal stuff, and the and the sepia tones, like mixed with yeah Renaissance cuffs and 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 ruffs, like it's still mm. it's still gonna have that feel. And that was that was excellent the first time. And I hope that with with the technology being a little bit better this time around, they'll just be able to run further with it. Mm. Yeah, hopefully so. But I, I mean, yeah. Well, what's your what's your feeling? Having kind of seen seen this and not played the previous games, Alan. Like, I mean, do you have 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 you had like an idea of what Deus Ex is about? Just sitting on the outside, kind of. I mean, obviously the the whole element of being able to choose your own path and kind of how your story progresses are very dependent on what abilities you've chosen to level up. That's that's the feeling I get from it. But at the same time, there's the way that people talk about it, and I think there are elements of it that sound confusing from the outside. We're like, you're not quite sure what you guys, what people are talking about, really, without having experienced <laughs> it firsthand. Mm. But mm-hmm. I'm, I mean, I've been interested in the series all along. It's just, it was one of those games that when it, when Human Revolution came out, it was at the wrong time. It was yeah, one yeah. of those games that there was other stuff coming out at the same time. Mm. You remember, like, Deus Ex is one of those perfect spring games, really, mm. is when it probably should come out. It's that time when it doesn't have a hell of a lot of competition, when there is time to play something rather than being up against the annualized things in, the, in, um, in a year. The interesting thing I had with Deus Ex is I, I, I had already tried to play the old one, and I was interested in Human Revolution, but then just passed on it. But then it came to PlayStation Plus a year later, sort of in a, just around a year later in August sometime. So end of sort of the summer break, like while I was at uni. Mm-hmm. And then that's when I played it. And like, I absolutely loved it. Like it just, that, that came at like just that right point, like where I had time off and I could <laughs> just put loads of time into it. Yeah. It did have, it, I remember having some glitches. I hope they, you know, be these big open world games with lots of things. I did play it on PS3 as well. So, uh, but glitches, glitches are a thing that I really want people not to have very often anymore because <laughs> they really get in the way. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, saying this... that, the, the the bigger these games get and more technical stuff going on, yeah. the more likely what, you're going to have glitches. Out all yeah. of those bugs, yeah. But one of the things, that, there was one of the ones kind of I remember, game breaking in it though, was there? Well, one of the ones I remember is there was a there was a trophy for going through without killing anyone. And that's generally how I kind of like to play these games, like like if Metal you Gear if you're dishonored. I find it very hard if I'm given the option to not kill people to do anything other than not kill people, because otherwise it, I just yeah, feel like I'm an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> um but then what happened was there are certain people in the game, certain enemies that if you shot with a taser, like if you stun gun them, they, they had, wouldn't stun, they'd just die. They had pacemakers. Well <laughs> yeah, you can you can make up some work around, but no, essentially they just died. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm. Uh, I thought the problem was that um, I think things could happen like you'd, you'd stun somebody and they'd fall into water because they were stunned and their faces and they were face <laughs> down in water and they'd mm. just drown. The, but, um, no, my, the one I remember is that it was literally like in the main first city and you go into like a, a sort of drug den apartment and there are some guys in there and I, yeah, I just stunned them all and then like three of them were dead on the floor. That's when I realised. I was like, huh. I know. And so then I like reset it and did it again and it did exactly the same thing. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, because yeah, no, I heard a lot of people kind of complaining about the difficulty of getting that particular achievement slash trophy. But mm. I suppose, <laughs> I suppose that if, if like the game was just going to cheat on you and tell you that people were dead, <laughs> it was pretty much impossible to get. Yeah. But, that, that, but it was it was nice to accept that mm-hmm. early on, and then I was just like, okay, let's just play. Mm-hmm. I won't worry about that anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll just murder everyone instead. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I I'm just really glad that they're making a sequel. To be honest, because mm. all of the stuff that happens with like Squeenix around, um, what well, was like the beginning of last year, them kind of complaining about, um like a few of the Western studios not managing to make the profits they were hoping for. Like, mm, Yeah, they, they they said like Tomb Raider undersold and, and then they released like last week it sold 8.5 million or something. Yeah. It's like, but that um, was particularly after the, you know, the re-release, the definitive edition. Yeah. I think before I said, that it, it was still sold a lot. Million. I something. think before, before definitive it was like 3 million or something. Really? That's, yeah. 
like three and a half or something I, like that. I think that's, that's still a lot though. Like that's more than is, like any PS3 exclusive has ever sold. <laughs> Yeah, but they, you know, again, it was kind of their bloated idea of exactly yeah. you know, how how successful it should have been, and the amount mm. of money that they spent on advertising and like pushing yeah. that. You know, Maybe the that's of exactly why they are some. making a sequel because you know they've they've done all the legwork of of like reestablishing the brand. They should they might mm. as well cash in on the on the efforts that they've they've already put in. Mm. Mm. I, I definitely Deus Ex is one of those games like it had a lot of. People really liked it, I think, after it came out. But then it, it, I was surprised they didn't talk about it for so long. And they, and they didn't, and then they released like that iOS game, which, which people didn't really like. Yeah, I heard it, I heard it wasn't particularly good. And then they did the, do you, did you see the April Fool's joke they did? No. A couple of years ago. And it was like a 2D Deus Ex, (laughs) like on their website, like a little like 8 bit version. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was really cool. And it was like, oh, this is, but they they'd actually called that something like it w- it wasn't mankind mankind divided but it was something like like human disruption or something stupid <laughs> but like like so it sounded like a legitimate thing but then obviously it was their April Fool's joke and it was like wow okay now does that mean you're going to announce your game and then like two and a half years later they actually do but <laughs> yeah I wonder I wonder how long we're going to have to wait for it to come out. <laughs> I wonder if they're going to be given the appropriate amount of time to like construct as much of a world as they had with the first one, or whether it just won't take as long, seeing as they don't know what they're doing better now. And well, I think they've been they surely they've been developing it since since two thousand and eleven or whenever. I don't see. This is the thing. I I'd, I'd heard, and maybe I was completely wrong in this, but I'd heard that like um a few kind of key pieces of the team that made the original one had um left the studio after that but i i checked online just before we started recording and like the like the director of the of um the first one of team revolution is is working on mankind divided um and i i was i thought that, that wasn't going to be the case at all so yeah i'm just very confused about what's going on <laughs> um i reckon it's going to be out before the end of the year to be honest i'll make that be the think? best yeah because i I like this return of cyberpunk thing that we've got going on. They're making, they're, they're, they've announced that they've properly announced they're making the next Tron. We're getting another Deus Ex. Mate, <laughs> this is, this is the business. <laughs> Blade Runner got re-released in cinemas this week. Yeah, I went to see it as well. How did you? How was it? Um, it was pretty good. It was pretty, I mean, yeah. I, it's one of my, it's one of my absolute favorite films of all time. Um, mm. which I suppose is probably why I like Deus Ex as much as I do to a certain probably. degree. <laughs> um, but yeah, like there's, the final cut of it is not as good as the director's cut and the final cut is the one they're showing in cinemas and it kind of makes it look a bit cheaper because they've kind of cleaned up all of the Mm. film grain which means that you can see exactly how much fidelity (laughs) there is in the effects which means that you can see exactly how bad (laughs) they are instead of (laughs) it being left slightly to your imagination you can see the uh the polystyrene pyramid yeah exactly exactly (laughs) but um no but it was really nice being able to see it in the cinema yeah, mm-hmm. that's cool. Yeah, we looked at. I we almost went, but uh, just didn't in the end. <laughs> oh, no, do you, do you? well. I mean, if it's if they're if they're I think it's already gone enough, out. But, um, oh man. But hey, um. Anyway, right? There's there's more news we've got to talk about, right, Dan? Uh, yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, I thought this is quite an interesting thing to talk about. A couple of weeks ago, uh, a Cheshire school conglomerate or whatever it. I don't know exactly what their company is, but Nantwich Education Partnership uh, sent out their letters to their uh, the parents of the kids at their school saying, um, if we find out that your kids have been playing uh, games such as Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty or other ones with unsuitable levels of violence or whatever, then we might report you to social services or the police. Uh, in because it could be a sign of neglect. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know how to feel about this at all. Because, like, obviously, like, the the kind of acceptance level of video games being appropriate for the kids of any age because, you know, they're perceived to be toys is mm. not particularly great. But yeah. at the same time, like calling people out for letting their kids in, indulge in any particular form of 
entertainment. <laughs> it's a bit, bit kind of overbearing. <laughs> I don't know. How, the, how, um, how do you guys feel about it? I mean, I mean, I think the particularly egregious thing about this is that they aren't going to the parents. Like, if they think something's a problem, they are taking it straight out of the parents' hands and taking it to some higher body. Maybe they're not, though. Maybe this is, maybe that's just kind of uh, the statement of something that they are prepared to do and that before any of that would happen, they would. Perhaps, but they did, but they didn't say that in their letters to the parents. They didn't say, we will talk to you and then we will take your, this to the, Mm -hmm. to the, we are, they didn't say, we're going to, we will assess it by talking to you. They said, we might report you. To social services and the, all the police, hmm. so that seems particularly strange to me. I, I do agree. Like, I think, I think parents often are not educated enough about it, and they're like, "Oh, it's fine that they're playing Call of Duty." It's like the generational divide, isn't it? Like, where yeah, I think parents just don't understand it, like to a degree. They have, they didn't grow up with it. Well, you don't forget though. So, don't forget though. We're saying parents. A lot of those parents okay, could be we're, our age. Okay, true. We're thinking. I'm thinking of like my parents and how ignorant they are to like games. <laughs> but then at like, the same time, I mean, you know, there's quite a lot of parents who, you know, letting their kids play these games that are, yeah, not much older than us. But yeah, there is true. definitely a, a a divide in term, you know, as you say, like generational divide, even between mm. people a, a little bit older than us mm. and people mm. a bit younger yeah. than us. But the yeah, like the biggest the biggest issue with all this kind of, any kind of age rating and stuff is the fact that parents don't really understand it. Mm. The amount of times that I've had situations where a parent sees an age rating and assumes that that's more like a board game rating when it's this is how old you have to be to, to be get able to this understand game. it, rather yeah, than <laughs> not necessarily with how violent it is. I don't think that's helped really by the way that our age rating system looks. Really, yeah. to be honest, it'd be good if it was just I, all the all of all the same as films. But um, yeah. I thought, it, it is, does it not look like that anymore? They changed. So, oh yeah. Yeah, it's still the kind of it's obviously before it was the the BBFC system that for the most part that was used in the UK, and so but, it was exactly the same. Yeah, so people understood that because they recognised, oh, that's the big eighteen rating I see on movies. That mm, I make they, that connection. They, now they it's, only it's ears they only 18, used to so. do it. They only used to do it with eighteen games, though, right? Under eighteen, well. they had oh, okay. They had like the they had the the grey box ratings didn't they like the the peggy ratings and yeah, then if it, if it was on I, mem- 15... I remember seeing like i remember seeing like san andreas had had the the proper like 18 certificate 18 like yeah sticker well, i remember it, but... all, like all the metal gear solid games as well they were 15 rated with bbfc right, okay. yeah, yeah. Those the ones. problem the problem back then was that not basically not all games were rated hmm. so the they brought in the peggy system to um which which stands for what now pan european Something or other. Hang on, hang on. I'll get out. <laughs> I got it. I got a page open. Pan European game information. Okay, cool, cool. Um, <laughs> and they and they like try and rate everything. So it's it's a more kind of complete system. But seeing as it's now a different system, it doesn't carry the same weight as yeah. the, the film ratings do to people I, that don't necessarily understand where it's coming mm. from. Yeah, I now, like I said, I, even the, just the the way that it looks looks more like the age that you would see on a mm-hmm. you know board game box yeah. rather than what they're used to, which is yeah the, the BBC one looks more official. It looks mm. like an official stamp, whereas this one looks like it's for a, a toy. Yeah, I mean, I think that is probably like the key to it almost, like because these are they are coloured like those ratings, but they are squares, whereas the rating that everyone understands on films is the circle in the UK. I, I mean. And, like, I think that really would have a big impact. Like, people do understand the film ratings. Like, they wouldn't... They're, well, not all the time. They, you know, but they would consider not letting their kid watch an 18 film. They would make an assessment on that. I don't know. Because like, I, I, I hesitate to kind of guess any which way with this, because... I mean, I'm not a parent. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't, I don't know how I'd, how I'd feel in, in the sit, uh, in that situation. If I was, if I was sent that letter, I'm not mm. sure how I'd feel. And for the, for the people that like are already taking note, it might. I think it's, to be honest, I think it's all idle threats. At the, mm. you know, like as much as this situation, it sounds like to some people probably really shocking that they you know, they're going to be going over their head and going straight to mm. the police or whatever. I think it's 
other than the fact that social services probably won't even pay attention because mm. of the amount of other stuff that they got on their plate. If they had to send a letter to social services every single time they heard a kid talking about Call of Duty, they would be sending <laughs> 10 letters a week at least. Well, when I mean, there's maybe, more important things of like, this, I think, I think this child I think is coming day. to school with bruises. That's kind of more important than <laughs> yeah. they're talking about the headshot they got last night. Yeah, it's I not think, like um, social services aren't incredibly overstretched as it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, I think the uh, there's, a, there's an interesting sort of angle to as to why they might have taken this action now. And that's because uh, they've spoken about like really sort of knuckling down on neglect in the UK after there was there was quite a big sort of scandal not too long ago about like child neglect cases. So there's been a lot of sort of speaking out about cracking down on neglect and things. And there was sort of threats of like prison sentences if people are are found not reporting neglect. Mm -hmm. So there's some suspicion, like some suspicion on maybe they have interpreted that to mean. Uh, you know, they don't want to get, they don't want to get, uh, punished for not reporting it. So they would being overly cautious or something, but. I, that seems, that seems unlikely to me. But yeah, I think it, I think it seems, and to be honest, I think it probably comes down to, you know, there is, I think there still is a big stigmatism, like, like there is this gaming stigma, like it's for kids, it's, it's bad for you, it's, it's violent. It's it's a, it's a complete oxymoron. It's like it's really violent. It'll make you go out killing people, but then it's also for kids. <laughs> and mm. I think it's this weird, twisted interpretation that people still have. They don't understand of it. They don't understand like the breadth of it or whatever. So, so they, you think it's more more teething problems for the development of, of the industry? Yeah, but, think, but I think, think I think it's this. I think it's this. I think it's this generational misunderstanding. I think. But yeah, um, I, I mean, maybe, may, maybe, like sending these letters out is an attempt to kind of change the the understanding and the culture within this particular selection of people. Maybe mm. it'll have a really positive effect, but it just seems like a very heavy-handed way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think it'd be much more beneficial if they held classes to teach parents about it yeah like but, if they, but like, if they how many parents are going to turn up for that how, how many of the parents yeah. that are the the ones that don't don't give a damn are the ones that are going to turn up for the classes mm. yeah okay yeah maybe <laughs> true yeah i guess actually even if these letters all they do is just shock the parents into thinking about it more is yeah. if even if it does that and makes them look up exactly what these games contain and really mm. think about it then the ones that were less informed and that's the reason why they were okay with their kids playing stuff they might actually yeah, be like maybe. oh maybe i'll let you know get them to play this other game instead that mm. isn't so violent i still think it's, it's really the wrong way to do yeah. it though yeah I like agree. it's it's you get to know you can't do that you can't yeah. just tell people that we're gonna choose we're going to tell you you're raising your kids wrong and we're going to tell you by reporting you to the police <laughs> Well, but what if they are raising their kids wrong? No. no. Yeah, they might be, but they might not be. Like how many, like, like how many 18 films did you see when you were under 18? And your parents were fine. Well, with that. look, like, I I don't want to I don't want to say anything to to get my my parents in trouble with the police. <laughs> so uh, to be to be honest, like uh, the a few of the films that I that I did watch when I was a lot younger than eighteen that were eighteen rated, I was disappointed that I wasn't more shocked by them. I think I think <laughs> Alien is the best example of that. Like mm, it's yeah, yeah, it's an absolutely wonderful film. But by the time I saw it, because people had hyped it up to me so much, mm. I just I didn't feel any of the fear and tension that like mm. people were talking about <laughs> so yeah i i don't know mate I, I feel like there's some there should be some kind of attempt to retroactively change the ratings of films for kind of modern yeah, day sensibilities but at the same time there's such a vast library of films from the past mm. that's a lot to ask but still that's not a, that's not a, an unreasonable idea though because like the the tolerances have definitely changed like mm. massively like something like Alien would be a fifteen, maybe because of the blood, but I could see. I don't know. I don't know. Nah, it's, Alien, it's, Alien would still be an eighteen. Come on, do you really like think? It's, it's I don't think it would be. <laughs> like, mm. I think the chestburster scene alone would probably that's pretty grim. keep it uh, as an maybe, eighteen. Yeah. <laughs> but, hey. All right. I saw a fifteen where someone stabbed someone in the throat with a biro, though. And that's pretty. It's pretty. But how much? But how much of it did you see? Like, how was that edited? He walked around with a biro in his throat afterwards. <laughs> what film are you talking about? I feel like I, I, I've seen this. 
Uh, it's called Red Eye. Oh no, no, and I haven't. On a on a plane, there's some guy being a creep to some girl, and then she she retaliates by st- like when the plane lands by stabbing him in the throat. With oh, the fire and then Cillian Murphy, isn't it? Yeah, he is. Yeah. yeah. So the guy who played the Scarecrow in yeah. the mm-hmm. Nolan Batman films, <laughs> originally made famous for his role in Twenty Eight Days Later. Yeah. <laughs> I do love yep. Cillian Murphy. Anyway, guys, I think we should take a break and come back with some of the games that we've been playing over the past week. Mm-hmm. How's that sound? Cool. Good. Cool. All good right. to me. Well, we'll be back after this. Hello and welcome back. Um, so I have been playing more of Pillars of Eternity. I assume that you guys have been playing some new games as well as the ones that we talked about last week. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I guess there was, th- there was like a little bit of podcast I added onto, um, the episode last week talking about that. A uh, possible transphobic joke in Pillars of Eternity, and there's like an update on that that I guess I wanted I wanted to put in here as well because there was like a backer um, like gravestone thing that was put in the game, like a Kickstarter backer had uh, as lots of them had been able to um, had had paid more money to be able to put some of their own content in the game and a lot of that was as um like epitaphs um on gravestones throughout the world and this particular one was a joke that could be considered transphobic and i mean people were up in arms about it on the internet and then people were up in arms at the people that were up in arms about it on the internet um, <laughs> because classic internet. because social justice warriors and the people that don't like social justice warriors um so what happened was obsidian kind of went back over that stuff and asked the uh the backer who who put it in if they wanted to if if they wouldn't mind changing it they didn't demand that they did but they said that that it that they'd like them to, um, and the backer put something different, gave them something different to put in the game, and it was patched in. So that like possibly offensive, like small, I don't know, like three line poem, like limerick. Was it a limerick? It wasn't quite a limerick. Was taken out of the game and replaced with something else that they said. So I think, I think, hopefully. This means that everything has been dealt with reasonably and the internet mm. can calm the hell that- down, but of course it won't because it's the internet. Mm. I think that was a good way to handle it. Like, it's, it's, it's good that they didn't just remove it. They got him to, I think it was the perfect it. way to handle it, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really decent. I think they did exactly the right thing. Mm. Mm. The game, though, is, is just getting better and better. I'm, I'm <laughs> freaking loving it. Um, mm. and the, kind of way that it's that it's branching out and changing around itself is really interesting the the law of the world has become more apparent to me as, as i've got further in the kind of um the the way the history of the place that you're in has affected its people has become interesting enough for me to start reading the books that are in the game to get a, a better idea of it like different bits of it come up in conversation the kind of difference between the the nobility and um and like the peasants the the kind of strife that's happening in there in the kind of feudal system that they've got there it's fun to be caught in the middle of that and because of the background of my character which which I chose which is which is a, a political dissident means that I can really fight on the side of of the working man and <laughs> an insight revolution so um it's no it's it's brilliant I'm if if anybody thought they liked the sound of it in the last episode, I can only say that it's better than I said it was then. So, <laughs> so get it and play it. Um, cool. But yeah, what have you guys been playing then? Well, I think we we've both been playing more Bloodborne. Cool. I think it's yeah. uh, maybe it's just the endless battle really, that is. 
<laughs> yeah, a quick update. Like I, th- I've encountered a few things that I thought were quite interesting. Like I think it's done more horror things than I was expecting. There's like really ominous, scary things that happen. Excellent. There was a moment like after after I beat a certain boss, you sort of appear in this new area, and it was just like, what the is happening? <laughs> like oh, that. I mean, that seems. That seems incredibly fitting with the, the kind of like wistful, mysterious atmosphere of the Souls games. Like if it, mm. if it plays on that to kind of create oh, yeah, a horrifying yeah. confusion as you mm, get further just, and further in. The really creepy thing it does is it just changes things without telling you. Like it just, it, it, it I don't know, it shows you things without explaining them. And it's just like, oh, yes. <laughs> feels so uneasy. <laughs> <laughs> like the ground shifting underneath you. Yeah. <laughs> and giant gnarled teeth spurting out of it to <laughs> enclose you in some kind of toothy cage. Yeah. Mm. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but apart from that, I, I did a catch up on my Telltale games. So I played two episodes, episode two and, th- oh no, sorry, episode three of, uh, Game of Thrones? Of Game of Thrones and episode two of Tales from the Borderlands. Mm-hmm. Um, which were were both really good. Uh, so, as I, I said before, I'm more interested in the Game of Thrones one. Um, mm. But obviously, now this is the, this is where it gets interesting. Mm-hmm. So, episode two of Game of Thrones, which I, I I did play episode two of Game of Thrones and episode uh, one of Borderlands a while ago, and I didn't mention them on the podcast. So, quick update on those. Episode two of Game of Thrones, after me praising episode one so much, was pretty much rubbish yeah that's what i that's what i'd heard generally from from the, um, the whisperings of the internet so it was it was really awkward like some of the dialogue sounded dodgy um not much happened and then it ends <laughs> it ends really 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 badly uh with one of the characters singing a song about another character that's died mm-hmm. and essentially what the song involves is describing the events that you've seen up to that point Mm-hmm. And it's just just in song. Mm-hmm. So the events that have that happened in the previous episode, or you know, and in this episode, essentially they just sing. Uh, they, they was in order, in like chronological order. They just sing, describing Wait, to you what's happened, it, and it's so awkward. Is it <laughs> is it like um an attempt to um does it does it take the events that have happened to you specifically into account? Is it does it maybe, change? Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know, I don't but know. it that doesn't. Seems, it doesn't matter. That seems like it's an interesting just, kind of. A, well, maybe it's just executed really poorly, but an attempt to is, do something yeah. very Game of Thronesy, which is like to yeah record the events of 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 the emotional history of wherever the fuck you are in in music. Yeah, like, may, may, it kind of except it the just problem doesn't is, work. is it does it does it it does it so blatantly. Like it's literally like this person did this, this person did this, this person died. La la la. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just the most embarrassing thing. It was so awkward. Like I was playing it with with Sally and she was just like, what is this? <laughs> so I take it the the new episode, episode three is, is better then. Yeah, a lot better. And like the, uh, another problem with episode two it had is it, the, the characters from the TV show started to get in the way a bit. Like they felt like they were being forced in a bit. Um, it, that, that's still kind of similar with episode three, but episode three just had a lot more going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a lot more interesting. There was a lot more interesting scenarios. It, it was it was like back on form, I'd say. Okay. Um, so there's hope for the season yet. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, and they are they seem to even be touching upon things which are relatively significant, like in terms of like Game of Thrones lore, like like the stuff that's like not really been touched upon. In other things, like they are starting to. I don't know. There's been some sort of suggestions in certain angles. Do you think which maybe? Is interesting. As I mean, we're about to get the new, like the new season. Is season five of Game of Thrones airing? Um, yes, yeah, yeah starts yeah. starts like next week, weekend. Yeah, It'll start next week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, maybe they're knowing that they they were going to be bringing the episodes out whilst that was mm. going on. They're allowed to kind of cover a little bit more time, mm. which I think would be really awesome. Like, I think it'd be really cool if they start suggesting more in the TV show because I'm I'm ha- having read the books. I'm pretty sure this season of the TV show is going to overtake the books. Yeah, in, I mean that's, a, yeah. that's a few, I've already a few heard areas. statements yeah. that they're going to be spoiling yeah. book stuff or yeah. changing it, yeah. even. which makes me super happy. 
Yeah, I think I th- I'd like the TV show so much more than the books. I know I'm a Philistine. I don't give a I re- damn. I really, I really like both, and I'm yeah, I do, I do really learning. like both. I'm happy you. to be learning new stuff because mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to be getting that next book anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think this this season, I mean, this episode definitely picked Game of Thrones back up. Have you but, had to? Has there been any Peter Dinklage in yeah, the game? Yeah. Has he been yeah. as bad as it, in Destiny? No, I see. I think he's fine in Game of Thrones. I think I think he can pull Tyrion out of wherever. Like he he can do Tyrion well, and I think he hasn't seemed weird at all. Okay, uh, hasn't seemed disjointed really. I, I mean, you can maybe pick fault with it, but I I think he's been pretty good. And I think all the all the TV show characters who've been in it have been good. Um, I'm not so sure that the the acting in um, Destiny was as phoned in as it kind of felt like i think they were going for an atmosphere of kind of a a, a bit of a, a feeling of of separation from what was going on anyway i mean like um you've you've played dishonored right dan yeah you know how everybody in dishonored has that way of talking that's kind of like relatively monotone but it just adds to the atmosphere Maybe I don't think that's what they're going for with Destiny. No. I think they would just kind of be like slightly. Ro- they uh, I think they probably were just like do a slightly robotic Tyrion, <laughs> which essentially came out as disinterested. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so how's how's Tales from the Borderlands then? Tales from the Borderlands is better. Cool. In it's like I don't know what it is. I think it's something weird about it because it's comedy. Mm-hmm. Because the tone is whole, so like completely different from what they've done before. So Walking Dead and but don't and forget, don't forget they it's were like, doing um, like Sam and Max and um, what the hell is the name of that other game? Um, Strong Bads. No, I can't remember. The, <laughs> I can't remember the rest of it. But like they did, yeah, they did do um, comedy before they before they were doing uh, yeah Walking Dead. But, uh, from so the ones I've played, I played Back to the Future, Walking Dead, mm-hmm. um, and. Wolf Among Us, which, and, you know, Walking Dead, Wolf Among Us, Game of Thrones, all very serious. Uh, and then this is like, is, it's totally riffing on that Borderlands kind of comedy. And what's really interesting about that is you don't have your emotional, not, not you don't have your emotional, emotional involvement with the character, but you can sort of make them into char- characters more. So you can like make them into caricatures. Uh huh. Which like lends itself to the comedy. So like, Sorry. you know, you've got when you say you, you mean you as the player. Yeah, you as the oh, player, like capable of picking you... dialogue options that are more hilarious. Exactly. Oh, yeah, cool. and then you can you can sort of stru- construct them into a weird caricature. So like the guy you play, um, I think he's called Reese. Is a Hyperion employee who thinks he's he's heading to the top, and then you know, hits a roadblock along the way. So you sort of, like, you can play him as this sort of goofy, sort of really cocky guy, but who was a bit shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so, and because you've got, you've got two characters, you've got him and then you've got this, this sort of, uh, uh, bounty hunter woman, sort of, uh, playing, you know, they're sort of like bouncing off each other as like characters in the game. And like, it just really lends itself. And I think they've got, it's really interesting, like introducing, comedy timing into you like having your own input Mm -hmm. and then they do really funny things like where they have you know like where it's like someone will remember this yeah like at the top of telltale games like they use that so well no i've i've heard this (laughs) i've heard that there's like good little moments where Mm. um i I don't know i'm not sure i want to give examples because then it's kind of stealing the punchline in the game yeah yeah exactly yeah (laughs) But yeah, just being being very clever about the kind of es- established norms of of the mm. the genre that that Telltale's kind of the sub genre that Telltale's created for themselves, yeah, like yeah. using the tools of that for more comedy effect, under- understanding where the fourth yeah. wall is and exactly mm. how to just poke it a little bit, just to stretch um, it out, not necessarily break all the way through. But yeah, and what and what's also really good about it is that's exactly what Borderlands does, like in itself. Yeah. And so it fits so well into Borderlands. And also, the story's really interesting. Like, like it's weird when pe- I hear people say, like, oh, Borderlands is, is fun, but it's a, you know, its story's a bit rubbish. Like, I think if you actually, I don't know, I've always found Borderlands much more engaging story-wise than I ever expected I would. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, like, the, I think the characters are really good. And, like, I think this works really well. And I think it makes the world even more interesting, like... You know, you're, you're meeting people, you're talking to them, you're hearing about the sort of 
the politics like in certain areas like nothing there's nothing heavy but it's like you know people's assumptions about different aspects of of the world and stuff mm -hmm. um yeah and i think i think it's really good like it's really interesting well to maybe see it's the exactly maybe it's exactly what borderlands needed in the 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 kind of story that you get when you're when you're playing the first person shooter games that it mostly consists mm. of is very very kind of drip fed to you you've got these these mm. interesting characters that mostly exist to hand you missions but in between that yeah. they have these excellent bits of flavor dialogue so if you can yeah. really commit some time to developing the the kind of a comedy of the world like getting stuck into mm. some more of those characters and also building up the the mythos of the of the vault hunters at the same time mm. then it probably just makes everything else better yeah i think it'd be i think it'd be really good if they took some keys from it like in the next borderlands as opposed to just going full uh grinding like collection stuff if they put some more like adventure aspect like kind of things and they do have sort of like you know go collect this item and they do have good punch lines with certain items you need to collect and things in borderlands but mm -hmm. I don't know. I definitely playing this makes you feel like Borderlands could do more, mm -hmm. like to to give their characters in their world and their world more personality. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah. So that's my that's my update. So go going going well. Looking forward to the next ones. Ah, excellent. Well, I mean, ah, oh, you you left me with a tricky decision because I was determined to to get stuck into those Game of Thrones games once the whole season was out, <laughs> but I hadn't been really considering giving Borderlands much of a look. But if it's better than Hells, I might have to yeah, get both know, as like, well. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there might be on one of them at least. I think's on sale at the minute, but um, mm -hmm. for the season pass, but. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah, Alan, so you've been playing Blo Bloodborne as well, but you've also been playing a game like Bloodborne, like a Souls game that's not really a Souls game, a Souls-like, if you will. <laughs> yes, I've put, well, it's even got Souls in the name, uh, Titan Souls, I've been playing. So it's kind of a, it's an indie title from uh, a developer called Acid Nerve. And I think it's only like a three-man team that make it. Mm -hmm. but that's a good the, name. This is yeah. this is another one being uh, published by Devolver Digital, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, another Devolver one. So, I mean, the, the game is essentially a mixture between Bloodborne and Shadow Colossus, which coincidentally we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, which sounds perfect. Yeah, and, <laughs> but with it, but it looks like essentially an old Zelda game. It's being like you know pixel art, top down perspective, and yeah, the the whole game is is based around. Just the idea it's a series of boss fights. You you have this relatively open world to play in each kind of divided into these different, I guess, regions. You have like a central point of a region that has like a that you can find that's kind of your respawn point, and then from there there'll be like three or four boss fights that you will that you can go and tackle in any order you want to and then by doing those boss fights you unlock the next section and so on and so forth. Just going through the fight and it's as with Bloodborne it's ridiculously hard it's <laughs> I just kind of when I was loading up on your actual save file it tells you like how many bosses you've fought how many times you've died and <laughs> after fighting seven after beating seven bosses I died 127 times <laughs> <laughs> there is a this this thing of like you go you can go into fights and it lasts a second you know, as soon as you have to, every time you go into one of the little arenas where you fight one of these <laughs> enemies, you have to wake them up by firing your arrow. Mm. But then you could just be standing at the exact point where you're just going to die instantly <laughs> as soon as you wake them up. So that's so, the, the, this is the method to like actually attack yeah, them, right? You've so got the, you've got the arrow the, that you can shoot, and then you press another button and it returns to you. Have yeah, I got that so right? the, like the the mechanics are incredibly simple, but it's in a similar way to something like Bloodborne and Dark Souls. It's using simple mechanics, but in more interesting ways and figuring out the systems so of the game. Each of these so different the bosses is, in this, is a kind of puzzle in its own right. Yeah, totally. So they, yeah, all of the bosses have their own kind of weak points, but sometimes it might take you, like I said, dying. 50 times to figure out how to beat them <laughs> before you can really start progressing but the, the, yeah the mechanics are incredibly simple you have you have fire an arrow you have one arrow 
you don't there aren't more you can add to your quiver you just have the one arrow but then you can <laughs> either run out you either have to run over and get it back or press the fire button again to kind of recall it but by doing that you have to stand still for a few seconds while the arrow comes towards you very risky <laughs> or you can uh then you've got a, a dodge move so you see like a dodge roll or if you hold it down it's a sprint um just yeah just using these like really simple mechanics fighting these incredibly creative bosses they like mm -hmm. they've the boss fights themselves and the boss designs and stuff like that they you know they've done really well and i i've mm -hmm. only fought maybe i don't know 12 now i think which i just don't i don't think i'm halfway through the game yet hmm. but it's yeah like i they've done some incredible work and it looks beautiful as well mm -hmm. like the whole art style I mean, I, I've been looking forward to this. After, I only heard about it really recently, actually. but um, when we went to EGX a couple of weeks ago, we got to have a little go at the demo. And I think the demo's been released on PC now, hasn't it? Oh, I don't know. Oh, if it has, then, yeah, I'll, I think, then I'll give it another go. I, I barely I think, tried yeah, I think, it. I think there is a demo of it on Steam, yeah. I think the demo got released this week or something. Um, but exactly what you were saying, like, I didn't really know how to play it to start off with. And I went into this first boss room and I was like, oh, what am I supposed to fight a boss? There was nothing moving. Then I, you know, there's there's this thing in the middle of the floor, so I shot it, and it was this cube, and then it just fell <laughs> on me. Yeah, that <laughs> happened to me. But it's also funny is the fact that you get as soon as the boss wakes up, this really dramatic music starts, and each boss has its own <laughs> music, which is really oh, cool. Perfect. But then as soon as you, the instant you die, the music just cuts out. <laughs> so you get square, da, 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 and just from. Uh from what I remember, and I, you can attest to this probably, it doesn't have Bloodborne's problem of load times. It's got a it, different uh, problem in oh, terms okay. of load times. It doesn't have long load times, which is right, but the problem, like, my really, like, only issue with the game so far is the fact that when you die in a, mm. in a boss fight, you don't just respawn right away in the arena with the boss. You respawn mm. at as I said before, there's like these central spawn points in the middle of oh, a bunch okay. of different arenas. So it does like you die, you get a fade out where it fades to black and then mm. it fades back in and you're mm -hmm. at the central bit and then you have to make your way back to the arena, which can take oh, okay. up. Like I timed one of the early ones and it's about 20 seconds from death to get him back in. Which isn't so which bad if you only die three or four times in a boss. But if you're gonna... but when you're dying 50 mm. times yeah. and yeah. it's like, I, uh, you know, I lasted a second that time, I really want to just get back in and do it again because I messed up mm -hmm. and yeah, I it really it slows it down and makes you start to think, like, oh, I just want to get back in. <laughs> it's interesting this, like, the how the quick turnaround can, like, really lend itself or, like, really punish a game. Because, like, things like Hotline Miami, you die, you you click reload, you are straight back yeah. in it. Mm. Or your or your super hexagons say like mm. this the, the second like, you're dead is the second you start again as well. Yeah, exactly. Like but it would totally break those games if you Well, I mean it was it was though. kind of a thing that was that's been introduced as the technology has got better and better. As the hardware's got better and mm. better and those load times can be made shorter and shorter. You can have these very, very simple games that are very, very difficult in the second that you die, you're straight back at the start again. So you don't have to, mm. you don't end up kind of reveling in the fact that, that everything's gone horribly wrong for you. You just, you're just there. You don't, you just pick yeah. yourself back up and get back in, which is, which <laughs> is great. But, um, mm. yeah, I, I suppose though, if it can be a part of your design to want like the player to feel that they have failed. To be punished for mm. <laughs> their own failure to to achieve in well, I guess I guess maybe the aim is if they make it shitter for you when you die, you feel even better when you actually beat the bosses. Mm. Well, I think that is the I think that is the the Souls mentality. Mm -hmm. Like I think you know Souls does has historically done everything to punish you. Like whether it's you know if you die, your health gets cut in half, or you know in every game you lose all of your money. Essentially, or... <laughs> <laughs> so they always do what they can to make you feel shit before you succeed. <laughs> um, what's the what's the kind of narrative conceit in um, <clears throat> in uh, Titan Souls actually? Because I like the little bit of the demo I played. It was basically just wandering around the world long enough to walk into a boss and die. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, from what I've played so far, like I haven't no, there isn't really a narrative unless it's a very subtle one that I that I maybe I'm not. I'm missing or something like that. Oh, but that's, a, that's a little disappointing. I yeah. Mm. I mean, it's, 
I guess at the same time they're kind of focusing on gameplay more than anything else. But yeah, there's still I still don't even really feel like I have like why is this person doing this? You know why mm. why are they fighting these monsters to get to the end? And there's you know there's no like actual narrative to speak of mm-hmm. that I can tell at least. Mm. You know, no yeah, no words telling you about the legends or anything like that. It's just you arrive in this world, you start fighting monsters. Mm. You get like, to the next visu- area. I, th- I think visually, like it looks really compelling. Like it's got this really ancient sort of looking architecture and stuff, hasn't mm. it? And it's very, it's very green in places. Like it's a shame that they haven't. That there isn't a bit more. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe there, maybe there is. Like at the end or something. I or think it's maybe it's it- one of those things where I could I could totally. I'm expecting there to be something subtle going on that I will kind really of become more apparent as it goes on. Mm-hmm. But f- yeah, for the minute, it's. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know. It's at the same time, it's kind of surprising and disappointing that it there isn't an, a narrative going through it. At the same time, mm. it, I when you're playing it, you don't necessarily miss it. Yeah, you know, you're kind of so invested in just trying to beat these bosses and get mm. to the next one that it, you know, it kind of is almost in the back of your mind at those points that there yeah. isn't really a story. But well, the, I mean, you know, when you so were saying, saying about that, the like, environments, the mm. there's there is a big mixture of stuff. I mean, so far. It's like the beginning of the game is in almost like old temples. Looking like a bit yeah, like the like snow. There's like snow-capped mountains. There's a forest maze with like hmm. different different parts of the, you know, kind of doorways or whatever in the maze that you go through take you to almost randomly different places. It doesn't make sense at first, but <laughs> it can is predictable afterwards when you're like, okay, if I go that way and then back through the same door, I turn up here and then go up <laughs> that way. But that, you know, I've also like pretty much inside a volcano is one part I'm just in at the moment. So, the, hmm. you know, kind of the color palette is definitely very mixed. And the, you know. that sounds cool. Yeah. The, the, the bit we saw was in, like you said, the, the temple mm. kind of area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if, oh, if they've got that attention to detail in the environment, though, once again, it just makes it <laughs> more disappointing than not taking advantage of that to kind of, create some kind of narrative within the world but yeah maybe and i'll be waiting to hear about this from you maybe, maybe <laughs> there is more to it so um maybe hopefully i it's <laughs> kind of i suppose it kind of sits in a weird place because when you have when you have a game that's like really pared down is about essentially one mechanic then stripping stripping the story away from as well can leave the designers more free to just explore what they can do with that mechanic as much as possible, but it feels like if there if there's this extra coat of paint on it, if there if there is if there are these interesting environments, if and I assume the bosses feel like they've got character as well. It seems strange yeah, to not totally. have some kind of overarching idea of how it, how it all fits together. Hmm. Yeah, but hey, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> um. So I mean. You briefly mentioned it, but I'm wondering how you're getting on with Bloodborne now as well. Yeah, I mean, I haven't had as much of a chance to put in as much time as I'd have liked. I've, you know, progressed a few more areas, beat a few more bosses, and yeah, still still loving it, but I, yeah, I need the time to be able to put into it. It's definitely a, it's a time suck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> like, it does take, you know, a lot of well, time to get through it and and progress and to really make any can progress in it rather than just yeah. going through the I parts got, you've I'd already been through of, I got to a point where it was kind of started feeling I kind of hit a wall in an area I was in mm-hmm. where it's like mm-hmm. I'm not some some of the enemies I'm coming across I'm not tough enough to get through this to get to the boss at the end of it so it's kind of retracing all going to, back to old areas to just try and level up as much as I can mm. I found yeah. I found when I was playing um, like Dark, Dark Souls the first one that when that happened, there was usually another route that I hadn't found before that would take me to a different part of, of the game world where things might not be so incredibly challenging. Uh, I think at this point I've just kind of... I don't know if the last area I was in I managed to get through when I shouldn't have at the level I'm at. <laughs> but, it, yeah, I feel like I've pretty much been everywhere I can go at the moment. Mm. Like, this There's one path the, is the way for me to go, pretty much. There is a few things I've found. I've had a few things where i've gone down one path and then been like oh no i can't do this is there somewhere else to go and then i have found another route like you know 
I like looked online. Like this is, <laughs> and I don't feel bad about that. Like, like this is the things with the Souls game. Like looking things up is like part of it, especially when you get towards the the later game. Like you need to start understanding things, otherwise you're really going to struggle. Like so, learn, you know. And I, there was another door that I just had not seen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, maybe. When I, you know, when I've done with with Titan Souls, I'll probably go back to it and yeah, try and power through. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's definitely, I don't know, like, some people, like, you know, in the lead-up to any of the Souls games, people have been like, oh, are they going to make it more easy? Bloodborne isn't easy. <laughs> no. <laughs> no Actually, what like, I mean, because it's more, because it's solely focused on the melee combat now, because there aren't, there's, there isn't an option to be a pyromancer and just sit at a distance and fling spells mm-hmm. at your enemies. It's, there's no, there's no option for it to be easier. Yeah. I have, apparently there are spells, but they're really late game. Oh, okay. And I, I haven't, I haven't got to them yet. Mm-hmm. But you can seen, also, uh, I've, you can I've seen as, other people use spells on me. Yeah, I've, I mean, you can also kind of put a lot of your level ups into your firearms, and there are like more exotic mm. weapons that you can get further on in the game. What, what, for, what are the spells like that people have used at you? Are people like sending cloud bats storming at you, um, or, or something like that. Su- surprisingly similar. I fought a boss who is clearly far too hard for me at the minute. Mm-hmm. Who threw sort of what look like as if they've been set on fire with blood skulls yes <laughs> like so like multiple skulls that look like they are flaming blood at me <laughs> and and they just murdered me <laughs> perfect i yeah i um, mean such a good sense of a visual style in the souls mm-hmm. games like it doesn't surprise me at all that they've managed <laughs> to perfectly work out what their aesthetic is and run with it i have had i have i've had some more classic magic uh, more classic sort of the the Dark Souls kind of blue magic mm-hmm. as it kind of looks that sort of blue light, but um, uh, yeah, again, only only really two si- circumstances of each of those, like like one of each, really. I've hardly there's not much of it in the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, once I've maybe finished Pillars of Eternity, except by then <laughs> by then the Witcher Three is going to be out. <laughs> <laughs> how how long are you going to be playing Pillars of Eternity? <laughs> I did, I think it's going to take a while. <laughs> but anyway guys i think i think we should call it um mm-hmm. so yeah this has been taste my game face um you can find us um on facebook and twitter and on your podcatcher of choice and um, on itunes if that's where you go just search taste my game face and send your letters to um taste my game face at gmail.com um i've been azizi adiemo and i've been joined by alan heath Yo. And Daniel Slawson. Goodbye. And that was a podcast. Catch you all later. <laughs> Bye. Bye.
I mean, I, I guess also the fact I don't necessarily know what I'm looking for. I don't think we do, though, do we? No. <laughs> no, no idea. <laughs> Unfortunately. You're looking for the elves? The little, mm. the little sound goblins that... Th that'll be dancing across the, the waveform. 